In today's world, there are two revolutionary isms that advocate fighting for communism instead of just endlessly waiting around for it. These isms are anarchism and Marxism-Leninism-Maoism. While many anarchists are initially hostile to what they might view as an authoritarian or hierarchical nature within Maoism, when studied more deeply, many who identify as anarchist, and particularly anarcho-communist, find that most of their political objectives are better achieved through the practice of Marxism-Leninism-Maoism than through any other form of political organising. Now, this video doesn't seek to force an unprincipled unity between Maoists and anarchists that simply papers over the real political differences that do exist. We've covered the concept of left unity in a previous video and stated clearly that there can be tactical unity on single issue matters and low level unity in various forms of united front mass organisations. But that the highest form of left unity is the ideological unity and cohesion of the Communist Party, which today is the Marxist-Leninist-Maoist Party. Instead, this video will simply seek to outline why anarchists should study Marxism-Leninism-Maoism, the ideology that's currently leading the most advanced revolutionary movements in the world today. Before getting started, this video has been made possible by leftwingbooks.net, a radical left-wing distributor based in Montreal where you can find Chris Plebedev's publications as well as numerous other anti-capitalist, anti-colonialist, feminist and other left-wing texts. Leftwingbooks.net has put together a collection of texts that deal with the complex relationship between anarchism and Marxism which you'll find linked in the description box below. While there's a plethora of great texts here, if there's just one that you choose to pick from this collection, I'd strongly recommend The Historical Failure of Anarchism. This excellent text provides a critical analysis of the history of anarchism, crucially coming from within the anarchist movement itself, looking at what precisely led to the failures in Ukraine, Spain and elsewhere, without lazily resorting to just blaming others, and instead tackling many theoretical cornerstones of anarchism itself head on in light of these failings. And it has to be said, most of its conclusions arrive at a place that looks an awful lot like Maoism, even if it refuses to call itself that. But as they say, a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. Leftwingbooks.net is currently offering a 10% discount to viewers of this channel for the Marxism and Anarchism selection by using the coupon code FREEDOMFORWHO. Get over there ASAP as this offer expires on the 24th of December. Free shipping is available on all North American orders over $50 and inexpensive shipping is also available on all Chris Plebedev publications in Europe. A massive thanks to leftwingbooks.net for sponsoring this video and making its production possible, as well as for helping to spread the revolutionary political message through their work. In particular, I want to thank Chris Plebedev for putting together a parallel collection of texts that look directly at attempts to overcome the divisions between anarchism and Leninism, as well as useful reflections upon this relationship. Anyone whose interest is piqued by the message of this video should follow up on this matter by having a look at this collection which you'll find linked in the description box below. And now, back to the video. Now it may come as a surprise to some watching this video that Mao Zedong in his early youth was strongly influenced by the ideas of anarchism and the Chinese anarchist movement. Involved in the student study groups that had been inspired by the anarchist 1919 May 4th movement, Mao was initially influenced by the anarcho-communism of Peter Kropotkin. But with the introduction of Marxist ideas to China and the study circles by the Bolsheviks who began operating in China at this time, Mao began to see the limitations of anarchism for advancing the revolution and developed into a committed Marxist. Many young people who are opposed to capitalism, especially in the imperialist core, are initially attracted to anarchism for its promotion of direct action and its anti-authoritarian methods of organising. However, after some time of being involved in anarchist movements, young revolutionaries often find themselves going around in circles and getting nowhere, jumping from one spontaneous protest movement to the next each of which appears to lack concrete direction and so simply just fizzles out time and time again. 
they can find themselves caught up in movements that are more lifestyleist than revolutionary, lack links with the masses, and uphold a petty bourgeois individualism that prevents them from becoming genuine revolutionaries in service of the working class, moving beyond flash in the pan stunt politics into actually building a revolutionary movement capable of overthrowing capitalism and building the desired stateless, classless, moneyless society. Rather than retreating from revolutionary politics altogether into something like social democracy, Maoism should be the next stop for disillusioned anarchists. With its focus on direct revolutionary action, it should appeal to the anti-capitalist and anti-authority youth, who need to cut through the lies, smears and extreme exaggerations put forward by counter-revolutionaries against genuinely revolutionary movements and grasp a firm understanding of Maoism. Marxism-Leninism-Maoism is the third and highest stage of revolutionary science. It's Maoism specifically, and not any other ism, that is leading the revolutionary class struggles that exist in the world today, through the strategy of protracted people's war that was developed by Mao Zedong during the successful Chinese revolution. Today, under Marxism-Leninism-Maoism, there are revolutionary people's wars raging in India and the Philippines, while others are being prepared and rebuilt, particularly in Latin America, as well as Asia. At the same time, Maoism is inspiring a new generation to get organised across Europe and North America. And many of those who find themselves embracing Maoism have, at one point or another, identified as anarchists. And there are good reasons as to why this anarchist to Maoist pipeline exists. Let's take a look at some possible explanations for it. An essential component of Maoism that anarchists should immediately relate to is strategic centralization, tactical decentralization. What this means in essence is that while the overall strategic objectives of the movement are agreed collectively and centrally, their implementations are decentralized, with concrete conditions on the ground being a major component in forming which tactical steps are taken by the revolutionary movement in a given area at the local level. While at first, many anarchists might oppose the idea of the need for strategic centralization, combining it with tactical decentralization can go a long way to overcoming fears about authoritarianism and hierarchical organizational structures. In a revolution, there needs to be an overall central plan to get from capitalism to communism. But Maoism recognizes that the tactical implementation of that plan or overall goal of the revolution must be fluid and left up to the cadre and revolutionary masses on the ground, allowing for significant freedom at the local level. Because, as we say, it's the masses themselves who make history. This model of strategic centralization and tactical decentralization can extend into virtually all areas of society, including the workplace itself. While the overall strategy of the economic direction of society is organized on a planned basis, worker self-management at the local level can readily be accommodated within the framework of a planned economy directed towards communism. That is, real, meaningful control over the means of production for working people directly, and not just at some indeterminate point in the far-off distant future. Like anarchism, Maoism doesn't believe that the revolution ends with the victory of proletarian forces over the forces of capitalism and imperialism. Instead, Maoists believe that this is only one step on the road to building communism, the stateless, classless, egalitarian society that stamps out all exploitation and oppression for good. Following the victory of the revolutionary forces, Maoists believe the work of building socialism is carried forward through the process of ongoing cultural revolutions, aimed at intensifying the class struggle and creating a new proletarian culture to pave the way for communism and rid society of the ideology and practices that remain from the various forms of oppressive class society, that is, slave society, feudalism and capitalism. The creation of a revolutionary culture, of course, begins long before the triumph of proletarian forces over the bourgeois forces, through the process of class struggle and collective organising, something that's not possible through the activity of more individualistic strands of different movements. 
Cultural revolution also provides the opportunity for the masses to rise up directly against the Communist Party itself if and when it misleads the people back towards capitalism. Following Mao's famous incitement of the revolutionary masses to bombard the headquarters of the party that seeks to lead them astray and carry forward the revolution for themselves. Perhaps one of the fullest realizations of directly giving all power to the people ever realized in any society to date. Indeed, if articulated through an anarchist lens, one could even describe the Cultural Revolution in China as one of the key moments in the history of anti-authoritarianism and anti-statism. So if, as an anarchist, you're concerned about all power corrupting and seeking to perpetuate itself indefinitely, then Maoist Cultural Revolution offers the solution to this. And finally, to those skeptical of the concept of the proletarian state, or semi-state, quote, withering away, you're correct in identifying that this won't happen magically by itself, but that this too will be the result of the people rising up in proletarian cultural revolution. However, before we even get to the point where cultural revolution under the proletarian semi-state becomes necessary, the mass line, the communist method of organizing and providing leadership, as developed by Mao Zedong, is a core principle of Maoism that, when implemented correctly, is the best guard against the development of a quote, red bureaucracy within a revolutionary organization and movement. Preventing a revolutionary vanguard from becoming some elitist group that's detached from the masses. The mass line requires revolutionaries going directly to the people, listening to the issues that are facing them and their wishes to address them, taking these issues and wishes back to the revolutionary organization to study them, systematize them and develop plans and campaigns to address them, and then return to the people with the proposed solution in order to provide leadership to them and mobilize them to address the issues that they face. At this point, the strategy for solving the issue will either be accepted by the people and carried forward, or it'll be rejected. In which case, the revolutionaries return to the drawing board to further develop the strategy before presenting it to the people once more with the hope of putting the solution into action. And so on, over and over again in an endless spiral with the ideas becoming more correct, more vital and richer each time. In this way, Maoism goes directly to the people, becomes one with them and is recognized as the people's vehicle for revolutionary change. Whereas other communist ideologies, confined to dusty old book clubs and debate societies, spending all their time having abstract intellectual discussions about this or that, rather than actually organizing and developing firm roots among the people, remain alien to the working class and oppressed masses. The mass lion method provides both direct accountability and leadership to the people. As we say, from the masses to the masses. A further component of Maoism that anarchists should study more deeply is the rejection of the idea of quote, actually existing socialist countries or AES. Maoism holds that while there are progressive countries struggling against imperialism that must be defended against invasion and all other imperialist aggression, there are no existing socialist states in the world. The former socialist experiments having unfortunately embraced revisionism or the capitalist road. Maoism advocates the struggle against revisionism as a central plank of building the revolutionary movement. A problem that many anarchists have with Marxism is the misguided notion that revisionist states, which have long since abandoned revolutionary class struggle, are upheld as ideal societies by Maoists. However, revisionism is a distortion of Marxism that Maoists oppose just as much as anarchists do. Indeed, Maoism itself in many ways arose as a correction to the revisionist elements that had emerged from the earlier Marxist-Leninist movement in the 20th century. And more than just a distant critique, Maoism as an ideology outlines how to overcome revisionism with the broad masses through the mass line, within the party through line struggle, among comrades with criticism and self-criticism, and of course at the societal level with cultural revolution. This set of tools, when used correctly like any other tool, 
successfully sweeps away all revisionist illusions and errors among the people to carry forward the revolution to the stateless, classless society that we all seek. As well as this, Maoism contains within it a concrete step-by-step -step strategy for the seizure of power that all anarchists should study. The strategy of protracted people's war. This is a comprehensive strategy that has both political and military aspects. Some of the most important political aspects deal with the establishment of liberated revolutionary base areas as the foundation of the revolution and the building of new power in these base areas as the embryo of the new state under working class control. As Mao explains, what then are these base areas? They are the strategic bases on which the guerrilla forces rely in performing their strategic tasks and achieving the object of preserving and expanding themselves and destroying and driving out the enemy. These revolutionary strongholds become the bases of the fight against capitalism and imperialism. It's within these areas that the revolutionary movement consolidates and then expands and grows. Within the base area, the people are mobilized for the revolution and are empowered to take control of their own communities through people's committees, which become the alternative power structures necessary for winning the people away from the old reactionary state to the new revolutionary power, essentially creating the dual power infrastructure and backbone necessary for the development of the new revolutionary society. Maoism has a tried and tested step-by-step -step guide for achieving this, where other ideologies either hold dogmatically to outdated narrow insurrectionary approaches, or have fallen into the illusion of believing that the bourgeoisie will simply hand over the keys to their state apparatuses peacefully once enough hearts and minds have been changed. Revolutions need the correct structure, a clear leadership strategy and militant discipline to be carried through to success. Marxism-Leninism-Maoism offers this to its cadre and the broader masses, where other ideologies can only conjure up imaginary visions of what the ideal society should look like without any concrete, tested, proven strategy for how to actually get there. Maoism, though only synthesized formally in the 1980s and therefore relatively young as an ideology, has the strength of having led and currently leading a number of successful revolutions, of formulating the strategy to overcome revisionism, and of outlining the concrete strategy for the seizure of power by the working class and the oppressed masses. To paraphrase a well-known saying, Anarchists should study Maoism because Maoism gets the goods. Beyond that, when studying Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, it's hoped that anarchists, at least collectivist social anarchists rather than individualist anarchists, will begin to realize that the achievement of all of their goals can be fulfilled within a Maoist framework. Now, ideally, anarchists will develop into Marxist Leninist Maoists, and we will keep encouraging you in that direction. But let's be honest, that's probably far too much to ask after just watching this one video. So in the meantime, hopefully anarchists, hopefully you, will at least understand that there is space for you within Marxist, Leninist, Maoist revolutionary movements to overthrow capitalism and establish communism. Specifically, at the level of united front organizing and various mass organizations, which for Maoists form part of the embryonic infrastructure of the new revolutionary society that will continue to exist beyond the seizure of power from the bourgeoisie. Within this new working class led society, numerous anarchistic goals at the local level can successfully be achieved, implemented and developed, such as worker self-management, the development of various forms of direct proletarian democracy, and of course communes of various kinds, such as the people's communes seen in Mao's China. And indeed, for those anarchists who would go one step further and are committed to overthrowing all remnants of capitalism and class society, these anarchists could play an important role in combating the revisionist backslide to capitalism and carrying forward the revolutionary transition through proletarian cultural revolutions to fully communist, stateless, classless society.
Right, thanks very much for watching this video. Thanks especially to the supporters on Patreon who continue to make each of these videos possible with their generous donations. Thank you Blue Collar Red, Owen Moynihan, Julia Affentranger, BJB7, Gato Ansok, Vangelo, Comrade Stu, Pretentious Joke Name, Jolie, Ugopnik, Vermin, Grimwater, Ryan Hodgson, Soup, Christian Napales, Alfonso Dingo Torres, Rock Artist, Zakasi, Anglo Irish Bolshevik, Thomas Rawson Wood, Bobby Block, Jason Schmidt, Mitch Schiller, Sirshini Vialin, Roja, MLM in Practice, Eric Lindahl, Robert Cherzak, Anastasia, Wonderbad, JT Chapman, Joseph Shepard, Comrade Amara, Wealth for the 99%, Peter Krause, Hagen Mitchells, Carlos De Luna, John Purser, Rodrigo Pichardo, Chairman Bro, Focha Fioca, Brian Lounge, Sexy Socialist, Catrist Maoist, Noel Hemdal, Richard Scott Wigton, Connor L, and Jason Pierce. Cheers everyone, August Longafoe.